today on Arts 24. I have gotten away with murder. Since his beginnings with Monty Python, for nearly 50 years, Terry Gilliam has been conjuring up strange and fantastical worlds. He rarely plays by the rules, often shunning the Hollywood system. Well, at the moment, I have no relationship with Hollywood. Yet serious actors queue to work with him, like Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt in the sci-fi thriller 12 Monkeys, soon to be re-released in France. We sit down at the Lumiere Film Festival in Lyon, where he's a guest of honour. Terry Gilliam, hello. Hello. I'm going to start with a very big question. Mm -hmm. What does an artist, an irreverent artist like you, think about today's world? I'm very depressed. That's why my new script is about God wiping out humanity for ruining his beautiful garden. I don't like the current world we're living in. It's closing, closing, closing in. People are frightened to say what they really think. They may say the wrong word. They might offend somebody. This is not a very healthy way of having a civilization. The minute people start worrying about speaking honestly, we're in trouble. We're sitting here in Lyon, the birthplace of cinema, 130 years ago. What do you think of... Almost as old as me. <laughs> What do you think of film in 2023? Stuff are being made. There's not much that excites me, is all I can say. I want film to be lively and surprising and offensive. I want something that makes me think. What's the last film you saw that you liked then? I like Quentin's Once Upon a Time in America. And he surprised me. He got me on the ending. So for that, Quentin, you get a big applause. <laughs> Your film, 12 Monkeys, has mm. been restored and it's being re-released here in France. It was inspired by a short um, 1962 French film, Le Jeté. How much does French cinema influence you? It influenced me in a negative way because it made me believe in the auteur theory, which I don't believe in anymore. I think the idea that one person, the genius, makes a film is nonsense. But I loved the Nouvelle Vague. It was a different way of looking at the world, especially for an, a, an American. Our world was very formed in cinema. Along come the French. What is this? Godard, Truffaut, they all were surprising. He's got a history, Doctor. Violence, insolence, defiance. Why don't you sit down, Mr. Cole? 12 Monkeys has been restored. It was a script no one wanted to make. You said that you were surprised anyone let you make it. Why did you want to make it? Because I understood it. <laughs> and it wasn't like anything I had read before, so... Let's go. It was unusual because it was unapologetically weird. Mm -hmm. And it starred two big names, mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt, who got an Oscar nomination for his mm -hmm. role. What was it like filming with these guys back in the 90s? I had met Bruce when I was shooting Fisher King. He'd come on the set and I was talking to him and I had not been a big fan of his. I didn't like Die Hard. For, I mean, I. I, they are what they are. They're really well made, but they're not what excites me. But he surprised me. He just seemed a different person than he was on the screen, and I liked that. So I offered him the James Cole part. And then along comes Brad Pitt. He came to London to talk to me. He's, again, from the Midwest, like me. I liked him immediately. He had wanted to be an architect like I had wanted to be an architect. So we got on very well. And I said, well, what do you think about the script? And he said, I'm really keen to play the part of James Cole. And I said, what? I've already given that to Bruce Willis. <laughs> so I said, but come on, you got to be, be in the film. So he played Jeffrey Goins. Now, that was a very big gamble because up till then, Brad in films had been rather what, slow, cool, easy talk. Not a motor mouth, not like Jeffrey Goins is. At first, I thought, this ain't going to work. And we're committed now. This is a bad mistake. But Brad worked so hard. He had been to psychiatric wards. He had been to mental is He just... Work and the first day of shooting is the first scene he appears in in the film, and he exploded on the scene. <gasps> Just breathtaking what he was doing. I love that when you actually give actors a chance to be what they've not been doing before. And Brad did it. He was breathtaking. I thought. You want me to, don't you? Get you out. And Bruce Willis plays a man who's sent back in time to stop humanity being wiped out by a virus. Has the film taken on a, a new relevance today after COVID? I've always been prophetic. <laughs>
we're not going, well, maybe we will go back to World War I again. Maybe the world is going that direction right now. We're looking at uh, uh, political systems out there that just, like before World War I, they walked into it backwards and were doing similar things. It's particularly horrible at the moment with what's happening in Gaza and Israel. It's just, I, I, it's like I'm in 12 monkeys. In your book, you appear to have been at present at loads of massive moments in history, <laughs> such as Martin Luther King's speech at Washington. That was 50 years ago this year. You are also at the Monterey Pop Festival. How much do these major experiences um, go into your work? I just felt good to be at, the, at those places when things were happening. Looking back, it's kind of like, well, I'm kind of like Zelig, the guy who turns up at all the ra major events of the world. But it, it didn't feel like that at the time. I was just doing interesting things. And you grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. You seem to have had a lovely childhood. What catapulted you into a life of art and irreverence? Actually, it probably happened in college. I went to a place called um, Occidental College. And I was there on scholarship because we had no money. But there were a lot of rich kids in this school. They'd come from wealthy families. A group of us got together and they just seemed to be freer in what they did. And there's something about wealth that just makes life more fun. I think the Lumiere, bro Lumiere brothers had exactly the same thing. Wealthy kids who got to play. And that's what happened in the university. It got me going down that road. <laughs> and then eventually making your way to England and being part of Monty Python. It just got bigger and bigger. Well, let's talk about that. You did grow up in America, but you're a British citizen. You yeah. moved to um, England in the 60s where you met the yeah. Pythons. I don't think there's ever been a group before or since who were quite like you. What was the secret to that dynamic? All of them had been to either Oxford or Cambridge. When I first came to England, I was referred to by somebody as a monosyllabic Minnesota farm boy. Okay, so I'm very different than they, but I had been such an Anglophile when it came to cinema. I loved everything about Britain. I, the sense of comedy there was very different than American comedy. American comedy tends to make fun of them or them. British comedy is making fun of themselves. And it's a way of surviving the loss of empire is my theory. <laughs> so there was something that just worked. And, and the chemistry was very unique. It involved all six of us. With one of us missing, it wouldn't have been the same thing. It was a weird mixture, but it was a chemically perfect mixture. <laughs> and you're still laughing, but you've had your own fair share of challenges yep. along the way, uh, to mention a few, the distribution battle <laughs> over Brazil, the troubled shoot of the adventures of Baron mm -hmm. Munchausen, the long journey to make uh, the man who killed Don Quixote, the death of Heath Ledger when you were filming The Imaginarium of Dr. Yep. Parnassus. When you take stock of it all, and you look back at this career, what do you make of it? I got away with it. <laughs> what I've had to do is learn patience, like on Quixote. It only it was 27 years in the making. So you learn patience, that's all you do. But once I've got an idea that's possessing me, I have to get it out of my system, that's all. <laughs> This year, filmmaking has been disrupted by the strikes. Tell us about your relationship um, with Hollywood over the years. Well, at the moment, I have no relationship with Hollywood. The last, Fear and Loathing was probably the last involvement with Hollywood. But I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, just across the hill from Hollywood, after we had left Minnesota. And it was always luring me. But I never thought I would be able to be involved in it because I don't like the rules of the game. I didn't like the kind of films they were making. So I had to go off to England and become a python. <laughs> and then only because we made Time Bandits and other films that were big hits in America, despite the fact we were not involved in Hollywood in any way, Hollywood wa wanted me. So I went and did a few films in Hollywood. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time and people at home watching all have a different favourite film of yours. I was just wondering, if I go through the list, if you could tell us one memory, one thought, one feeling right. about each film. Okay, starting in 1975, Monty Python uh, and the Holy Grail. Well, I'd never directed a film before, but Terry Jones and I said to the others in the group, we think that anybody named Terry should be able to direct this film, and the others foolishly agreed. So once you're up there as a director, people 
think you know what you're doing. And then we made uh, Life of Brian, which I think is Python's greatest film. It's really about right now, <laughs> but you probably wouldn't be made right now. 1985's Brazil. Oh yes, I was basically trying to uh, make Brazil much earlier than that, but couldn't get any traction. So I made Time Bandits, which became a big hit, which gave me the possibility to make Brazil. <laughs> 1988's The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. That was a complete nightmare, but it's probably one of my best films. We've just re restored it recently as well, and I watched it a couple months ago. I hadn't seen it in 20 some years, maybe 25 years, and I was completely knocked over by how wonderful it is. And I can say that because I feel completely disassociated from it. <laughs> 1995's 12 Monkeys. So I was on a roll. Now I'm making Hollywood movies. And here's a script that nobody wanted to make. Well, here, I'll do it. 12 Monkeys was, it was hard work, but it was a really good film. And I have to credit Madeline Stowe for getting me through the movie. She was the, the rock that I, I, I sort of held on to. Brad and Bruce were out there doing wonderful. Madeline is so important to that movie, so I want to credit her for her importance. 2009's The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Ah, it started out being an you know, absolutely wonderful film, and then Heath didn't turn up for work one day. Heath Ledger died in the middle of the shoot. The money people, the insurance people were running away. I didn't want to continue. I just wanted to lay down and give up. And my daughter, Amy, said, you've got to call Johnny Depp. And I called Johnny because I'd introduced Heath to Johnny years before, and they'd become friends. And Johnny said, whatever you want, I'll be there. All the money came back. We made the film. Johnny, Colin Farrell, Jude Law replaced Heath. And the film is quite extraordinary because it works. I actually love that film. <laughs> you always seem to be looking forward, Terry. Retirement? Does it ever come in to your head? No, death is more interesting. <laughs> Terry Gilliam, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>